This is one of the best adaptations of a YA novel Hollywood has ever produced. And this is an amazing book ruined by a director's obsession with nose hair. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I volunteer! I volunteer! I volunteer as tribute! It's hard to express just how special it felt to be a fan of The Hunger Games back in the 2010s. Like many, I was an avid reader. The American education system hadn't yet robbed me of my passion for reading, and the young adult genre had exploded in popularity to the point that even non-readers my age would crack open a book or two. Don't tell me. You're here for a special book. Juggernaut franchises like Harry Potter and The Twilight Saga had just concluded, so fans were experienced enough to distinguish between good and bad adaptations of beloved source material. And this is what made the stakes so high for the cinematic adaptation of the Hunger Games trilogy. See, from a literary standpoint, Hunger Games, Catching Fire, and Mockingjay have always punched above their weight class. While they contain generic YA tropes like a brunette tough girl protagonist, obligatory love triangles, and organizing its society into different clubs, Collins used these tropes to subvert and elevate the genre. On the surface, these books are highly approachable YA dystopian fiction, but underneath all the shine and spectacle, it's an unapologetic meditation on desensitization to violence, the cost of progress, and the types of trauma that can be mitigated but never truly mended. You love me. Real or not real. Real. In short, these books go way harder than they have any right to. As a result, there was a lot that the movies needed to get right, and even more ways that they could get it wrong. We'll take a look at the first movie later in the video, but for right now, let's focus on the four films directed by this guy, and ask ourselves, does Francis Lawrence do the books justice? Well, sort of. Francis Lawrence first joined the franchise in 2012 when he signed on to direct Catching Fire. Just like the book, Catching Fire takes everything from the first entry and turns it up to District 11. The politics, the pageantry, the passion, everything that was set up previously begins to bubble up to the surface. From a stylistic standpoint, Lawrence leans heavily into everything that makes the Capitol so alluring. And this works because the second book is all about how the Capitol is trying to distract people from the brewing discontent in the districts. People are starving in 12. Here they're just throwing it out to stuff more in. Katniss wears makeup and is made to look more traditionally attractive because President Snow is using her as a pawn for the Capitol. There are more visually appealing settings because it creates a contrast between the capital and the poorer districts. The action is bigger and more entertaining because the capital is going all out for the third quarter quell. I want them dead. The second movie is so great because the vision of the source material and the vision of the director are perfectly aligned with one another. But therein lies the problem. One of my favorite aspects about the four novels in the series is just how distinct they are from one another. You go from a story about survival, to the beginning of a rebellion, to a tragedy about war, and then jump back in time to see how someone could be seduced into supporting this oppressive system. The monsters! All of you! The franchise evolves in radical and intense ways with each new installment, but unfortunately, Francis Lawrence doesn't. Take Mockingjay, for example. The book is intensely psychological in nature. Even though the plot is about revolution that spans an entire nation, we are trapped in Katniss's perspective. She is so traumatized and disconnected from reality that the revolution unfolds around her like one of her nightmares. Peter, will you stay with me? More than either novel that came before, Mockingjay is defined by the inner monologue that Katniss provides throughout. The first person present tense allows Suzanne Collins to capture a level of apathy and dissociation that is usually reserved for actual war novels. It's one of the few pieces of writing that manages to capture a similar emotion to the puppy scene from The Things They Carried. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just be grateful and don't look it up. Like The Things They Carried, Mockingjay is less about the war itself and more about what war does to people. And that's a nuance that seems to completely go over Lawrence's head. His two-part film adaptation approaches the source material very literally. The extended runtime means that most of what happens in the book makes it into the movie, but the perspective with which we view these events changes how they come across. Take for example when Katniss sings The Hanging Tree. Are you, are you coming to the tree? 
In the movie, Francis Lawrence uses it to set up a montage of the revolution. And don't get me wrong, it's a good montage, but it misses the whole point of the song. In the book, Katniss starts out by singing the melody Rue taught her. The notes that, as she puts it, ended up as the background music to her murder, just as they did in the Hunger Games before the mutations broke through the trees, chased us onto the cornucopia, and slowly gnawed Cato to a bloody pulp. Desperate to ward off these memories, Katniss begins to sing The Hanging Tree instead. Are you, are you, come into the tree? A song her father taught her. A forbidden song. A song that is in and of itself a subtle act of rebellion. In the silence that follows, she reflects on the lyrics. The tune might seem harmless enough, but the lyrics are incredibly grim. A man accused of murder, himself killed, beckoning his lover to come share in his fate, to join him in the world that may or may not exist beyond her own, because death is better than whatever sort of life she might lead. Katniss judges him at first, but then she remembers. Didn't I want to kill Peta with that syringe to save him from the Capitol? Was that really my only option? Probably not, but I couldn't think of another at the time. The other characters' reactions are also important in this moment. Katniss feels guilty because... Everyone is watching me intently, and Pollux has tears running down his cheeks, because no doubt my freaky song has dredged up some terrible incident in his life. Great. Meanwhile, Plutarch is just happy that they got it all on camera. A little on the nose, but of course so is war. And that mentality is exactly what's wrong with Lawrence's direction in this scene. Yes, he accurately filmed the events as they happened in the book, but without any sort of attempt to communicate Katniss's inner monologue. All the thematic nuance of the song is lost in favor of it being an epic bit of background music. Even more insidious is the fact that they sold this song as a pop single in order to promote the movie. I mean, there's being tone deaf, and then there's J-Law's Rebel remix of Hanging Tree debuting on Billboard's Hot 100. That's true. That's like 100%. Every, everything you said was true. See, I think the problem is that the director's greatest strength is also his greatest weakness. The stylistic choices that made Catching Fire so amazing make Mockingjay feel fundamentally at odds with itself. His visual style is very objective, so while he captures the grandeur of the Capitol and the Quarterquell Arena excellently, the tight corridors of District 13 are absolutely boring to look at. In the literal sense, District 13 is supposed to be drab and monotonous, but the books use the setting as a metaphor. Katniss is as much a caged animal here as she was in The Hunger Games. The winding passageways reflect how difficult it is for her to make sense of both reality and her own thoughts. Working through her trauma is complex and scary, and she'd much rather find a place to hide, shutting out everything and everyone. While I'm not a huge fan of the movie overall, the cinematography in Joker does an amazing job at making a drab or ugly setting visually interesting. Not to mention how well it reflects the psychology of the main character. Lawrence gets away with not depicting Katniss's inner monologue throughout Catching Fire, because that book is all about how disconnected from the rest of the world she is. Sure, there's a revolution beginning to take shape around her, but she doesn't have the bandwidth to process that. She's just focused on protecting herself and the people she cares about. Get food for Prim, get treatment for Gale, get Pita out alive. Mockingjay is the opposite, though. Katniss has fewer immediate responsibilities, and so is left with much more time on her hands. Time to consider her role in the revolution. Time to ponder what lengths she is willing to go to to win this war. Time to reflect on who should be in charge, and what she has to live for once this is all over. And the movies just don't really depict this in any meaningful way. They're much more focused on the visual manifestations of war. In favor of showcasing bodily harm, Mockingjay Parts 1 and 2 fail to highlight the scars that left on one's soul. While it's unfortunate that the misguided direction kept the Mockingjay movies from being as great as they could have been, I wouldn't say Lawrence's stylistic choices actively tarnished what was great about that book. However, the same cannot be said about The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. But before we discuss the director's obsession with nose hair, let's talk about Flexispot. Because we all know that to survive these games, you're gonna need a sponsor. Does your back hurt from carrying the weight of an entire revolution on your shoulders? Or, you know, day-to-day -day life? Well, one of the best ways to reduce back pain is by utilizing a sleek, sturdy, 
and easy to operate standing desk like the FlexiSpot EW8. Believe me when I say that this video would have taken at least twice as long to write if it weren't for this desk. I always get uncomfortable if I sit for too long, and I'm naturally fidgety, so having four different programmable heights means that the FlexiSpot can adapt to whatever setup I need on a moment's notice. This flexibility lets me stay focused for way longer than I would otherwise be able to, and when I do need a break, I can easily store my laptop and other devices in the attached drawer. Add on to this the three front-mounted USB ports, and it becomes clear that the EW8 is more than just a standing desk. It's a complete workstation. FlexiSpot products like this are a great gift for yourself or those you care about. The three-step building process can be completed single-handedly in less than five minutes, and you'll reap the benefits as soon as you start using it. If you're interested in a FlexiSpot desk, click the link in my description to up your posture and productivity today. Are you... Are you coming to the tree? So, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is a really unique novel in the series. It's a prequel, it's more or less structured like a tragedy, the protagonist is one of the most despicable characters from the originals, and the narration is now third person limited, fostering a unique relationship between the reader and protagonist. At first glance, it's just a cool look at how Snow got the idea for his version of The Hunger Games. But as we all know, Suzanne Collins doesn't do shallow. The book explores whether people are inherently selfish and violent, or merely pushed to those extremes by the society they are born into. It shows how tribalism is fostered by inequality, and how oppressors are threatened by those who are self-sufficient. The story paints a tragic portrait of a man who could have had everything he needed in life, but who was too much of a coward to trust in the good of others. Lucy Gray! I said, are you trying to kill me? Even years before Katniss and the Mockingjay, Snow's need for control was already sowing the seeds of rebellion. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. But when it comes to the movie, I'll just come right out and say it. I think Francis Lawrence fundamentally misunderstood the source material. At 2 hours and 38 minutes, the movie covers pretty much everything that happens in the novel, except the perspective through which we view these events conveys a very different message. There are two big issues I have with the cinematography in this movie, and the first is Lawrence's obsession with nose hair. For some reason, almost any time a character is shown on screen, the camera is shooting them from below as if the cinematographer is performing a booger check. At first I thought it was an accident. Maybe the camera operator was doing his best and just happened to be a short king. But then they managed to shoot from below Peter Dinklage's eyeline, making it clear that they were doing this on purpose. So what exactly was Lawrence trying to communicate here? Well, maybe he was trying to make the world of the capital and its citizens feel strange and off-putting. Except he uses the same angles to capture Lucy and the other tributes, so there's not actually a contrast between the capital and the normal world. Okay, if not that, then maybe he's trying to capture the essence of President Snow, a power-hungry narcissist who looks down at the rest of the world. Everyone likes an underdog. I don't. This is a better reason, but it still doesn't work. In terms of being an unreliable protagonist, the low angles do create a disconnect. But the problem is, you're supposed to connect with Corio in the beginning. The character is objectively charismatic. His motivations are almost always self-serving, but he has a talent for gaining people's trust and manipulating them as he sees fit. The camera work should start off making us feel intimately connected with the character, only to realize we can't trust him as time goes on. When it comes to making him feel larger than life, yes, the camera work is effective, but it still misses the point of the book. This is not a story about President Snow. It's the story of how a young man was molded into that person. Put simply, it's his Joker origin story. So to communicate this, you want to lean into the contrast between who he is at the beginning of the movie and who he is at the end. This shot at the end of the film perfectly encapsulates the essence of President Snow, but we never establish who Coriolanus is. Because every shot of him in the movie looks like this, there really is no impact when we finally get to this point. I think the real answer is, Francis Lawrence just decided to do it this way for the heck of it, and that's allowed. But it ends up making it incredibly difficult to connect with any of the characters on screen. There's a reason the close-up is the most powerful shot in cinema. Eyes tell us what a character really thinks or feels, even when their words say the opposite. Eyes make a creature feel human even when they're not, and eyes are what allow a person sitting in a movie theater to form a powerful connection with a completely fictitious character. But when you interfere with that connection, it makes it much more difficult to invest in a character. And when you do 
this for every character in your movie, you make it impossible to invest in the story. The other big issue I have with Lawrence's use of cinematic language is how he approaches the Hunger Games itself. What are the Hunger Games for? While the Battle Royale portion of the novels are undeniably thrilling to read, Suzanne Collins has said before that the games themselves are her least favorite portion to write, which makes sense. This series is meant to condemn violence, not condone it. The action is necessary to both the plot and message, but Collins is incredibly careful not to glorify it. This is even more true in Songbirds and Snakes. By the time the 10th Hunger Games have rolled around, viewership of the event is way down. Way down. It's not an elaborate event like we see in the first two books, but rather a drab and obligatory tradition. A big part of Snow's arc is figuring out how to make the games not boring to watch. So how does Lawrence approach these incredibly primitive and unique games? Well, unfortunately, with the exact same techniques that he used in Catching Fire. You know, the third quarter quell? The arena that couldn't possibly be more different from the 10th Hunger Games. I love changes in aspect ratios, but the use of IMAX in this film is so tone deaf. Not only does the expanded ratio not make sense in the confines of an indoor arena, but it inherently glorifies the violence that it's depicting. The broadcast of the 10th Hunger Games is meant to be janky, and stand in stark contrast to the highly polished productions we see later on. Killing another on my account? One. Can you give me a tree right there? Sure. But the director wants to turn it into a spectacle, just like the Capitol. If I recall correctly, IMAX was also utilized for the nature sequences in Act 3, and in my opinion, these should have been the only times it was utilized. The expanded ratio for close-ups truly endears us to the main characters, and the wide-open landscapes communicate that, despite what Snow thinks, this is the life he should be living. But once again, because there isn't a contrast between games and nature, this message gets tarnished. Francis Lawrence is undeniably a talented director. He has made plenty of amazing movies, and Catching Fire is one of my favorites, but it is also undeniable that he was the wrong director for this film. So who should have directed The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes? Well, this is the funny bit. They already had the perfect man for the job. I went upstairs, I started reading about 10 o'clock at night, I finished about 1 or 1.30 in the morning, and literally put the book down and said, you know, I have to make this movie. I just have to. And I literally got on a plane Monday morning and flew to England to see Nina Jacobson, who was the producer. I mean, I had to make the movie. Gary Ross directed the original Hunger Games back in 2012, and was initially set to return for Catching Fire, but stepped down when he realized that the quick turnaround wouldn't allow him enough time to do the source material justice. And that reverence for Colin's writing is clearly evident in the first film. Sure, there are some details that get rearranged or omitted, but no other entry in the franchise captures the essence of the books to this degree. For one thing, the camera intimately connects us to the protagonist's point of view. Shots aren't necessarily from her her perspective, but the camera holds on and moves between objects in a way that directly conveys what Katniss is focusing on. When it comes to blowing up the supplies, the camera, the audience, and Katniss all put together what needs to happen at the same time. When Marvel attacks Rue, the camera focuses on him because he is the biggest threat. It's only once he's been eliminated that Katniss notices that Rue is injured. The camera makes this realization feel just as sudden and horrifying as when Katniss describes it in the book, not to mention how vividly it translates her sorrow. Perhaps most importantly, the lens through which we observe the arena is Katniss's perspective and not the Capitol's. I know people complain about the shaky cam in this movie, but it's one of the few times that the technique is used correctly. Steadier framing would highlight the act of violence, putting us in the mindset of an outsider watching from the safety of our own home. The kinetic shaking instead highlights the reaction to violence. We are in the arena with Katniss. We are just as frightened and disoriented. The only time we can calm down and steady ourselves is when we are alone or with someone we care about. I admittedly enjoy watching the first movie less than Catching Fire, but that's kind of the whole point. So how exactly would Ross's approach to filmmaking be better suited for The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes? Well, first of all, I think he'd be much better at putting us in the mind of the main character, and we wouldn't have to jump up their nostrils to get there. The way Ross uses camera movement to communicate focus would work even better for Snow than it does Katniss. Unlike Katniss, Snow is hyper-intentional with everything he does. The juxtaposition between his pedigree and finances means that, at any given moment, he is both predator and prey. He must always be on high alert, and showing the audience all of the different little things he focuses on could perfectly capture how he approaches every moment like it's a game of chess. Moves and counter moves. 
Ross's handheld aesthetic would also ground the story with camera work that feels almost diegetic. However, the most important difference in how Gary Ross would have adapted Songbirds and Snakes is the way in which he would have approached the games. Let me ask you one final time. What are the Hunger Games for? Unlike his use of close-up shaky cam in the first movie, I believe Ross would have filmed the action in a much more reserved way. Not big and bold like the cinematography in Catching Fire, but static and from afar, like how they recorded the arena in the narrative itself. Suzanne Collins didn't want the reader to feel like they were participating in the 10th Hunger Games like they did in the 74th or the 75th. She wanted the reader to be stuck watching them from afar, through low-tech monitors and limited camera angles. I wish we had a camera inside of the duct, but we don't. Ross would make the movie not about Lucy Gray's fight for survival, but about Snow watching it. Her victory would matter to the audience, but only because Snow needs her to win in order to get what he wants. Even if Lucy Gray Baird somehow wins it all, I will do everything in my power to ensure that you don't see a dime. Ask yourself. How much do you care if she lives now? The only time the audience should have felt like they were in the arena were when the bombs went off and when Snow went in to rescue his friend. Would it have made for a less entertaining movie? Absolutely. But it would also have made for a much more poignant adaptation. There are other little things, like how Gary Ross captures the stillness of nature, or how well he depicts friendship. But it's all just to say that a director with his sensibilities could have truly elevated the final product. Sometimes, a great filmmaker isn't a great choice for a given movie, and sometimes, you gotta leave the dance with the one who brought you there in the first place. If you're interested in more analysis of on-screen adaptations, check out these videos on The Witcher. I'm Dylan, and this has been The Writer's Block.